So our final talk of the day is uh, the update from our executive director who needs no introduction, but Dr. Patricia Turner is gonna join us on stage today to share with us her uh, views as to where we are, where we're going, and uh, what it's like to be the uh, in new position as executive director. Thank you, Dr. Sutherland. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure uh, to stand here uh, to welcome all of you to um, a tremendous uh, day in our leadership summit. Um, it is really, it's been wonderful to listen to our extraordinary faculty. Um, I want to thank all of you who are present at what is, for many of us, our first face-to-face uh, -face meeting, perhaps of this size. Um, and those who are participating online because it is a new day. Um, and we need to be mindful of the experience of those who are participating remotely as well as those who are participating um, in person. Um, and I like to thank the staff of the college because uh, without them, uh, meetings like this are not possible. So I, I really do want to thank um, Dr. Sutherland and congratulations on your first leadership summit. Um, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes uh, this afternoon covering a little bit about my vision and my strategy for the college going forward, and a bit about some things that we've done, some of which may be known, um, but some of which may still be new. Um, it was my pleasure over the 10 years that I served um, in my previous role to go out and talk to surgeons year in and year out, and invariably I would say something that I thought everyone knew, and someone would say, oh, I had no idea the college did that. And so part of our strategy going forward is really going to be to enhance communication and make sure that we are sharing all of what we do and all of the ways in which we can support our surgeons and support the patients of those surgeons as we move forward. And I think you've heard some of that today. So I have no conflicts. So our motto is to heal all with skill and trust. Some of you of a certain age will remember that we said to heal all with skill and fidelity. But whatever the, the translation is that you prefer, you know, really this is our motto. And the keys to meeting our objectives are in that motto, which has stood the test of time. Uh, we are celebrating anniversaries, centennials, um, but the American College of Surgeons was founded um, really on this notion that we will heal all with skill and trust. And this is going to show us the way forward as we think about what the next uh, 100 years or 107 years will bring. So spending some time looking at that and really breaking up those few words which seem so simple, there is a lot implicit in that motto. So if we think about what it really means fundamentally to heal all with skill and trust, let's spend a few moments on this. So the first couple of words, to heal all, there is included in that notion this idea of inclusivity, of advocacy, of partnerships, because we cannot heal all we cannot touch all patients if we're not thoughtful about inclusivity. We can't heal all if we don't have all surgeons at the table in the college. That means all specialties, that means all practice patterns, that means all ages at the beginning of their career, at the end of their career. We cannot heal all if we don't think about equity and justice and partnership and advocacy. And this is, after all, the Leadership and Advocacy Summit. So we need to think about that just in those first couple of words, to heal all. The next notion of, of skill, uh, we know that the public, individuals on the street would say that surgeons are skilled, and so we're happy about that, but we have to continue at every turn to remain skillful and to continue our education in that way. So again, education, training, innovation, that is what we do as surgeons, we innovate. We solve problems in a new and different way. And so this notion of recognition, partnership, clinical excellence, learning, skills, that is implicit in all of what we do every day when we go to the OR and is our duty to our patients to remain mindful of enhancing our skills at every turn. The last couple of words, this notion of trust, incredibly important. The public, our patients, place their trust in us in a way that is different than any other physician, and indeed physicians more so than any other profession. And so as we think about what that means, that is our impeccable integrity. That is our values. 
Those are elements of community, of confidence, reliability, assurance, our quality programs, our ability to reassure individuals that when they come to see us, they are getting the best care at the right time in a way that is value added and is efficient and we are trustworthy and we are worthy of their trust. And so these elements I would submit to you encompass everything that we do. Everything we have done for the last hundred some odd years, everything we will do for the next hundred some odd years, and that if we are true to our motto, healing all with skill and trust, we will have succeeded. And I most certainly am thrilled to be a part of what that might look like going forward. So spending a little bit more uh, time on that as we talk about our internal priorities, what does it mean to, to serve all with, to heal all with skill and trust, looking internally at the American College of Surgeons? So this, again, same thing, looking at it to heal all. So we have to grow and support membership across all settings. And we've talked about that. You heard it from me for a decade, you'll hear it from Dr. Sutherland for the next decade. We have to incorporate an ability to be not only relevant, but essential to every surgeon. Whatever your practice type, your specialty, your subspecialty, wherever you might practice, urban, rural, highly resourced, under-resourced, we have to find a way to engage all surgeons. And indeed, the American College of Surgeons, I will always believe, is truly the house of surgery for all surgeons. And the more we lean into that, the better off we are as a profession and as an organization. We need to expand leadership opportunities for surgeons in all practice types. So again, depending on who you ask, we lean to academic, we lean to private practice, we lean to you know, coastal, we lean to middle of the country. I mean, everyone thinks that we're leaning in some other direction, but what our job is, is to make sure that we have leadership opportunities for all, and that we are equitable in sharing those opportunities, and indeed in communicating those opportunities. And we have to cultivate the spirit of creativity and innovation, which is something that we do naturally as surgeons. Again, when we talk about skill, we have to maintain the highest standards for surgical education across all platforms. We cannot rely on big box surgery meetings to convey education any longer. It is not possible. That is not the only way to effectively convey education. So we have to be on the bleeding edge as we think about ways to educate our members and what is the way that we can get the most knowledge out to the most people and what are those platforms and what is creative about ways to do adult learning and amplify innovative skills and techniques. So again, in the care of our patients, we are aware of what is um, evidence-based and innovative. And so it's a fine line. You wanna be first to market, but you also don't want to tilt after windmills. So we've gotta be thoughtful as an organization, making sure that what we're putting forth for our members is on the bleeding edge and is always evidence-based. And this notion of trust is not just with external individuals. There has to be more camaraderie amongst us. Um, I, am, I am pained every time I see specialties within surgery griping at each other on opposite sides of conversations about reimbursement or about you know, resources in a hospital system because we are so much stronger together. We are so much stronger when we're on the same side of the conversation and we don't have the fill-in-the-blank surgeons quibbling with the other fill-in-the-blank surgeons about resources because if we are together, there is no institution at which surgery doesn't drive the machinery of the hospital. I mean, I, I, it, show of hands, whose hospital doesn't run on the backs of surgeons? There isn't one. And so if we are thoughtful about how that does indeed give us power and taking a step back writ large, I mean, I wonder why, I know this is naive to say, but I'm gonna say it here publicly, why we can't all get on the same side of the equation as it relates to physicians and the healthcare system. I think that if we would stop griping with our primary care colleagues who are trying to eat our lunch in some cases on the Hill, and we all got on the same side of that equation, the conversation about all of the doctors on this side and those on the other side would be a much different one. And I know that's naive. I know people have been trying to do it for generations. But the fact that I may be naive in that regard does not mean I will not try to spend a lot of energy developing trust, facilitating camaraderie amongst surgeons and amongst physicians. Because together, we are much stronger in every possible way. 
We've got to include the other members of the healthcare team where appropriate. We are leaders of the team, but we are not the only members on the team. And we need look no further than all of the papers written to say that when we are in effective team environments, our patients do better. And so you can take an extraordinary surgeon and put that extraordinary surgeon in an institution with no resources and no infrastructure and no team, and that surgeon's outcomes will be worse. Conversely, you can take a pretty good surgeon, put that pretty good surgeon in an institution with incredible infrastructure, and even in complex cases, their patients do better. So it is not us in isolation, although we will always be leaders of our team. This notion of including other members where appropriate is essential. Surgeons in leadership roles. Many of you have heard me say, we need more surgeons in the C-suite. We need to control and lead, and more surgeons doing that helps us all. And so thinking about ways that we, in that trust conversation, get more surgeons, more physicians into the leadership, making those decisions, that reflects well on all of us. And then finally, this notion of articulating more clearly what we do and how essential we are. We need to tell our story, and I am thrilled to be able to work with all of you in telling the story of how what we do is so essential. I mean, we can talk about in the pandemic when surgeons willingly decided to cut back on elective cases because it was the right thing to do for a public health rationale. We constantly sacrifice in the service of the care of our patients. And so I am excited to be able to tell that story from the rooftops as often as humanly possible going forward. When we look externally, again, raising our profile across all sectors, that's gonna be critically important, emphasizing surgeons' incredible value in our integration with the healthcare delivery team. So again, healing all is not just surgical skill, we are part of the fabric of the good care of patients worldwide. And so we are physicians who care for patients and we operate too. So this narrative that somehow some other specialty, fill in the blank, really cares for the surgeons, I mean cares for the patients, and the surgeons just come in and operate, we are technicians, completely false. And I don't need to tell that to those in this room, but telling that story outside to the press, to the public on Capitol Hill, essential part of articulating our inherent value in the healthcare system writ large. Um, and again, sacrifice, I don't need to tell you all, a room full of surgeons, how much we sacrifice in the service of our patients. So again, I, I could spend all day talking about this, but I want you to know that everything that we do really does roll up into our motto. You know, the motto may be old, but it is not old fashioned. It is essential today. Conducting vital research, we do incredible research at the college. I want us to be the place where everyone comes for anything surgical. If you have a question about surgery, you have a question about the data, you have a question about what's the best operation, who's the best surgeon, what's the right way to do this, all of that, I want us to be in collaboration with all of the stakeholders where appropriate. We are the arbiter of all things surgical because I know that we can get the right answers. And if we think about those on the Hill making decisions that are going to impact all of us, don't you want them to ask us what it is that we should do? Our DC team is extraordinary. The Division of Advocacy and Health Policy has laid that foundation for years, and so we get asked those questions. We want even more of that. You want to lean in. Don't you want the you know, fill-in-the-blank newspaper to have accurate data about surgery and about surgeons? We want to lean into that so they come to us before they print something that may not be accurate. Or when it's a nuanced conversation and no one outside of medicine really understands it, we should be the place that they come to ask those questions and get good answers. And so, again, fostering trust is really an important element of this because, again, the stories are told about us, but not necessarily by us. So moving our work forward in 2022, in quality, streamlining our quality programs in one unified platform. So standardizing our approaches to the quality programs, integrating more fully with other specialties to make sure that we can work with them to make sure that quality programs are in place. We know how to do that. We have an incredible team led by Dr. Cliff Coe and many others um, that are really 
well-versed in the ways that we can improve quality and educate surgeons on how to be part of that process, how to lead it at your own institution. So we're going to lean into that, make it easier for hospitals of all sizes to access what we do. So smaller hospitals may have fewer resources, but to the talk that we just heard from Dr. Mason, equal does not necessarily mean equitable. So we want to make sure that we support our small, under-resourced hospitals and our big quaternary care, lots of resources hospitals. Because again, at the end of the day, quality, enhanced quality for our patients is the, uh, is the name of the game. In education, enhancing collaboration with those who are engaged in surgical education. We have extraordinary leadership um, in the mind of Dr. Sachdeva, who's been leading at the college and the Division of Education for a long time. And we know that we have partners, the boards, the AAMC, the ACGME, I mean, I could go on and on with all of the, uh, the initials, but there are lots of organizations with whom we can partner to exert a more profound influence on the way that we teach and train and educate surgeons at the undergraduate, graduate, and continuing medical education levels. And so making sure that we partner with our specialty colleagues to make sure that there's something, for example, at Clinical Congress that is of interest to surgeons of all specialties. There's gotta be a reason to engage with the American College of Surgeons. And I am committed to working to figure out how we make that value proposition more and more easy so that everyone says, of course, I will be a member of the college. Of course, I will come to and engage with the college on all of these fronts. Can we be more nimble? Can we turn things around more quickly? Can we be first to market or earlier to market? Again, if you need education just in time, what are we doing to make sure that you're getting that education in a timely fashion and it doesn't take us too long to turn it around so it's not useful to you? Member services, again, deepening our value proposition for each and every individual. I want every surgeon to want to be a fellow of the college. It's a, it's a high bar, but I am convinced that we can get there. And under the leadership of Dr. Sutherland, I'm 100% sure um, he can help us get there. Um, there are elements that we have not yet addressed in terms of supporting our members. You know, a more robust uh, notion of practice management. 70% of surgeons are employed. It is a different day today than it was 50 years ago. So yes, we absolutely need to support those individuals who are in private practice, in single, solo, onesie, twosie private practices, because those exist. And we also need to be mindful of those who may be in private practice, but in multi-specialty group practices, and those who are employed and not academic, and those who are employed and academic. There are a number of different ways to practice, and we have to provide that for our members, and it may look different. Again, making the point equal is not equitable. We need to provide different value for different types of surgeons, and we are a big enough and robust enough and um, uh, broad enough organization to be able to do that. Also um, in that vertical, and we've talked about it today, that was indeed the theme of today. Well-being and resilience is critically important. We cannot care for our patients if we don't care for ourselves. And when we talk about surgical workforce, we have got to be mindful of how it is that we support our surgeons and have them physically healthy, psychologically healthy, and we respond to the things that are bringing them down um, and that are keeping them from being able to practice at their highest possible level. And that is part and parcel of our ability to support our members and in the umbrella of member services. Um, advocacy, again, we have to lead. We have been leaders, we have to continue to lead. We have to use our voice. I need all of you to be part of our conversation. Um, we have an entire day tomorrow um, of advocacy uh, communications, and so I'm gonna hope that all of you are able to stay for that. We, again, have an extraordinary team in DC, and we want each of you to be involved, not only here, but in your states. I happen to be a native Washingtonian, so you know the notion of having a state and having representation on the Hill, for some of us, is a little bit of a thorny subject. But for most of you who have a state, um, I want you to um, be active here and also be active at home in your states. And if you don't know how to do it, which is what we hear, like, I don't really know how to do that. How do you go talk to a politician? Oh my gosh, I'm not really sure. We know how to drop the breadcrumbs and hold your hand through that process. 
And if we would all, quite literally, if all of the surgeons in the U.S. who are eligible to give to the PAC, if all of the surgeons in the U.S. who are eligible would respond when there was a request from our D.C. office, we would be hands down the most powerful voice in D.C., period, full stop. It's just that simple. So I need you to not only engage with us, but also when you go back to your institutions, talk about advocacy, talk about why it's important. It is a tough time to talk about politics. Believe me, native Washingtonian, I get it. We've been living and breathing. I mean, I'm in Chicago now, but I mean, I grew up in DC. So you need not tell me about how politics can be thorny. But what I assure you is that what we do at the ACS is done thoughtfully. We are not leaning right, we are not leaning left, we are not picking and choosing people based on you know, anything other than how do they help advance the care of the surgical patient. And you have incredibly smart and thoughtful people who are aware of all of those nuances that make politics so thorny. And we are thoughtfully using your dollars, using your influence to improve the care of the surgical patient. And so long as we center the patient, we cannot go wrong. And I am not at all worried about us getting into trouble on the left or the right, so long as we continue to center the surgical patient. And then finally, communications. We are developing all manner of improved digital platforms. There is a new website, which will be rolling out this spring, so please stay tuned. Um, there are elements that we're doing internally and intranet, which will help our staff work more efficiently. Um, our growing social media presence, you all know I'm a big fan of social media. Um, and the reality is, is that we need to communicate effectively, period. And that's going to be different for different people. Is there a recurrent theme that hopefully you're hearing? Um, it is going to be different. There are people who will follow us on Twitter, who will know what's happening at the meeting because they're following us on social media. There will be those individuals who read emails. There will be those individuals who follow the communities. There will be those individuals who really don't pay a lot of attention, but they come to the meeting once a year and they try to drink from the fire hose. And all of those people are legitimate. All of those people's um, way that they want to receive our communications are legitimate. And so our job as an organization is to meet people where they are, to make sure that we have something for everyone, to make sure that we're telling a story in a way that you're hearing it. And you may hear it differently from the person sitting next to you. That doesn't make either one of you better, worse, right, wrong. It means that we as an organization need to be robust enough to be mindful of all of the ways that people want to get information and convey it convey what is the call to action, give you information, make sure it's accurate, make sure you're well informed, make sure that your colleagues don't know something that you don't know because we should have told you. So if we think you need to know that, then it's our job to convey the information. And on communications, and this is my personal request to all of you and to all of you at home, um, I need to hear from you. Um, I know a lot about the college. I love the college. I have loved it for a long time. I have been a member for a long time before I was staff. But what I need from you is I need to hear from you what are we doing well? Where are our challenges? What are your proposed solutions to our challenges? We all have blinders. I can't possibly know everything that's going on in everyone's individual community or how it is that the ACS can best serve your needs. There's a lot that I know. We have incredible leadership, many of you in this room. We have incredible infrastructure at the ACS, but I would encourage all of you to participate fully in the closing the loop of communications with me directly through your leaders in whatever fashion that you want to communicate, because I do want to hear from you. So a couple of new leadership slides, and then I'm gonna stop because I'm probably already over time. Um, but there are some, some faces here that you may see in the room, and I want you to know who they are. So Natalie Bowden, I don't know if she's in the room at this moment, she's in the back, um, so raising her hand. Natalie is our new um, Director of Internal Communications. She is an incredible thought leader in the space, and we were lucky to recruit her away from our thoracic surgery colleagues. And she is running um, our internal communications. Um, Brian Edwards, who is over there um, on the side waving. So Brian is our chief of external communications. We were able to recruit him, a leader in 
external communications from outside of medicine. He is our person who will be our point person for op-eds, for um, the talking head shows, for, um, you know, he's already had us on um, NPR. He's already had us, you know, quoted in the New York Times magazine. So again, telling our story is something incredibly important. So we're thrilled to have these two uh, leaders. Dr. Simpson Mason, who you heard from just a few moments ago, I don't think I need to tell you that she was an extraordinary addition to our leadership team, along with C. Armstead, who's in the back. See if you might wave your hand. So I think many of you had the chance to meet C. Um, so the two of them together are quarterbacking our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. And Dr. Sutherland, of course, here in the front, um, who you've seen all morning, an extraordinary leader um, that has joined us um, and is bringing to bear all of his wealth of experience, private practice, and academics. He's been in the military. He's been involved in the ACS and leadership through his young years. We were young together, so I can say that. Um, neither one of us is so young anymore, but um, we're the middle-aged fellows association representatives, um, but um, has been deeply engaged in the work of the college for many, many years. Um, we also have um, Cindy Earhart, who is over here. So Cindy's picture's not on my slide even, she's so new. So Cindy is our new conventions and meetings director who has joined us from, uh, from pediatrics. So we have an extraordinary team. There are still um, more introductions to be made, but it's, we have an extraordinary leadership team that we're pulling together to support each of you. So I'm gonna actually stop there. I've just highlighted here on the slide, these are the divisions of the college. We have the foundation. Um, there is a table outside. We've done some incredible work supporting surgeons in, uh, or patients in the Ukraine and doing other incredible things through your generosity. So I would encourage you to consider um, what the foundation um, can do and has, has done. Um, also the PAC, which is out there, you know, again, hopefully you all have your PAC ribbon, and then our diversity, equity, and inclusion work. So again, I will stop because I could literally talk all day, but thank you so much for your attention. I'm so glad you're here, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Questions for Dr. Turner. I've just never seen well. this before. <laughs> we, have one. Okay. we have one that came in virtually that um, Dr. Carpenter wants to know if there is um, potential for a role for a national chief well-being officer within the college. It's a great question, and thank you for that. We have um, led our uh, well-being initiative actually with Kathleen McCann, who many of you haven't noticed here sitting in the front. So Kathleen has been really instrumental in our well-being work. Um, Jenny Mohan, who's here also in the room, has been the staff person. We have a well-being uh, task force uh, that I had the uh, pleasure of co-chairing with Dr. Mary Brandt, known to many of you. So we do have infrastructure around that. It may well be that over time we end up in a situation where there is so much there that it becomes its own separate vertical. Right now, it is a priority for us. It is under Dr. Sutherland's purview in the Division of Member Services. But there is no question that there is science around this. There's science around grit and resilience and mitigation of burnout. And we are committed to making sure that that remains a priority because without that, we are not allowing our members to work at the top of their game. So I'm not sure that we'll have that tomorrow, but there is more emphasis on well-being than ever before. Dave Welsh from in Indiana. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for the energy you bring to the organization. I would also want to make sure all our fellows know they can reach out to their governors, Absolutely. to their state chapters, and, and to their regions. And I, I, I know I'm not speaking out of term, is we all want to hear from the fellows and ready to, to help facilitate getting them to the wonderful resources at our college. Thank you for that, Dr. Walsh. And I will amplify exactly what you said. There are so many ways for your voice to be heard. And we do want to hear from you. Again, I'm happy to hear from you directly. And you have a regent that represents your specialty. Um, you have governors that represent both your subspecialties, the chapter in which you belong, if they're international members online, um, the individuals who may be in a certain country, there is a governor for that. We have advisory councils. There are 14 advisory councils, one for each specialty within surgery. So you have a voice. You have multiple voices. Your local chapter. 
um, is a way to be engaged. And so for the young people in the room who may want to know how they can begin to get involved, often the local chapter is the best way uh, to make that happen. But we have um, RAS, obviously, the Young Fellows Association. There are lots of demographic groups um, to which you can apply um, if you are interested in our humanitarian work, if you're a military surgeon. I mean, there are all of these ways to come in and become engaged, and we want you to uh, avail yourself of all of those ways. So thank you for highlighting that, Dr. Thank Walsh. You. Hi, Sarah Samreen from University of Texas Medical Branch. Dr. Turner, thank you so much for your amazing talk and your leadership uh, of the college. It excites um, not just uh, women in the room, but at, I think everyone is uh, looking up to you and looking forward to your leadership. Uh, my question is kind of similar to uh, some of the discussions that you and I have had in the past. Um, how And you answered some of it just now, but how do we get the younger surgeons, the new, um, not just the residents, but the fellows and the new uh, board certified surgeons to get more involved in the college. I understand some of it is at being a champion at the state level, um, but getting. I, I, Thank you. Uh, so getting that excitement going and uh, getting that fire lit to understand that we don't have to belong to just our specialized organizations, but college is what ties us all together as no matter what specialty you're from, but as a surgeon, um, how do we get everyone excited about this? Thank you. No, thank you for that question. And there is no question that many of you in the room have to help me with that. I mean, I can be incredibly enthusiastic, and I am, and I love the college, and I talk about it at every possible turn, so um, I will always be talking about the college and how amazing it is. But in some ways, the other piece of that that's so important is someone in the local environment. We know, for example, that fellowship in the college can be traced to a chair or program director who thought it was important, and if you trained in a program where your chair and program director thought it was important, then you will probably pursue becoming a fellow of the college. If you trained in a place where your chair and or program director were dismissive of the college or they weren't themselves engaged or if they, you know, some slight from a generation ago that they're still carrying around, I mean, you now are carrying that around too and may not see us as your specialty society. And so um, the conversation about remaining uh, not only relevant, but essential is something that has been in my mind for as long as I've been engaged with the college because I truly believe that we are so much stronger as a house of surgery for all surgeons. And if we are rolling up under one umbrella, that does not diminish the individuality of your specialty or your subspecialty. I mean, we have three layers down, four layers down of sub, sub, sub specialty societies. That is not extraordinary. And we expect that you will be a member. And I understand that we can have conversations about the time and the money that one has to invest because you want to be a member and an active member. But there is no question that there is no other society that if we were all together could not exert more influence on all of the things that are important to us. And so in terms of getting engaged, it may be, again, in your local state chapter. It may be through RAS or YFA. We even have a program for medical students. We have surgery interest groups at nearly every medical school in the country. And we have a staff person whose job it is to support our medical students. So being able to be engaged, I mean, there are drop-in calls where you can drop in as a resident once a week. There's something. You can talk about advocacy this week, education next week, communications a week after that. So you can drop in and out. We're mindful of the time constraints. We are going to have individual, um, an individualized approach to communication as we move through this process so that you get information and know about openings for committee appointments. Because in some ways, we haven't always communicated as fully what do you need to be a successful candidate? So it's one thing to put the positions up and say, yeah, apply for this. But if you're ill-prepared, you're not going to get the nod. So what is it that we're going to tell you? These are the skill sets you need to accept this leadership role. And so all of that together will help our, our pathway um, to leadership for as many uh, young people and not young people as possible. So thank you for that question. Wendy Green, Emory Surgery, thank you so much, Dr. Turner, for your presentation. I have a difficult question to ask. 
Uh, how, do, how does the American College of Surgeons address the leaky pipeline of trained physicians, uh, trained surgeons who get out into the workplace and get into practices that can uh, lead to the conclusion, early termination of their careers? How do we look as a house of surgery to support and find out how often is that happening um, as a um, as a female, um, African-American female, I uh, will get people who will seek me out and say that they're having, um, they're feeling, uh, they're being isolated and they're being um, uh, not in an equitable manner, uh, look, their outcomes are being looked at differently from their colleagues. And the environment is becoming toxic and they're about to, um, uh, they're needing to move on. How do we address either those work environments or create opportunities to um, uh, help with the well-being of those physicians. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Green, for that question. And I think that is incredibly important and speaks again to this notion of uh, our workforce and how do we make sure that we do not lose these incredibly bright minds. It is a shame for someone to get all the way through medical school and residency and become a practicing surgeon and then we lose them from the workforce. Think about all of the hours that have been invested in that individual, and then for that person to not be able to provide care is a tragedy. So there are a number of things that we're doing at the ACS, and there are a number of things that we can do more of. So um, we are trying to be as mindful as we can about the elements of practice management support. I literally was talking about this with Dr. Um, Pat Bailey outside the room just before I walked in here. What elements of practice management support can we provide for those individuals who are entering into practice? Because some of it is um, financial. Some of it is, you know, you've signed a contract and you've gotten yourself um, in a situation where you were perhaps paid more than what you were bringing in and you've, you know, you've moved your spouse or your partner and you've bought a house and your kids are in school. And then when time comes to renegotiate that contract, they have you over a barrel. And then you can't survive. So what do you do there? But you've got a whatever 100-mile non-compete and you can't move anywhere. So that is a contributor to burnout and, and is a problem. Um, there are elements where there are, are, is, uh, is inequitable treatment. And so those things happen as well. And we need to be mindful of what that looks like and then have those conversations about making sure that the pipeline is not leaky for things that are unreasonable. And, or the pathway is not leaky for reasons that are unfair or inequitable. And the reality is, is that we need to support surgeons across the board because we need all of them um, at the table. There are um, relationships that we've had in the past, for example, with the Shep Center at UNC Chapel Hill. They did a lot of work around surgical workforce. What does a workforce look like? How many surgeons are there in how many counties? What does that look like? How many surgeons do we need? The work of George Sheldon, who's known to many in the room, um, was around surgical workforce. I would like the ACS to be the arbiter of that, for us to wade into that space about not having anyone on the outside, the government or anyone else, tell us how many surgeons we need. Maybe we should figure that out. Maybe we have to think about what are the pipeline or pathways um, that we can do to bring more individuals in who will then practice in these underserved areas. Maybe there are things around um, loan reimbursement programs that have heretofore been the purview of primary care that ought to be the purview of surgeons. I mean, you can't, you can have all the primary care people you want with all due respect, and you can't treat a trauma patient with primary care physicians. And so if you're in a rural environment or you're in an underserved area, you need surgeons just like you need primary care. So there um, are reasons why individuals need that support, and we as a college need to be thoughtful and mindful. And so if you're leaving for any of these reasons, we have to figure out how to solve some of those problems and support our surgeons at all of those points along the pathway. The final thing I'll add is that when you're in practice, you've out, you've been in practice, you're in the middle of your practice, there are still challenges. The Medicare payment cuts that were going to go into effect that our um, DC team, along with many of you, were able to, to push back or, or to mitigate at least, kicking that can down the road year after year is still stressful for those of us that are in the middle of our careers. So if you can't pay your staff or you can't um, count on your reimbursement, we're working on that as well. So these are all elements that drive individuals away from satisfaction with our practice, and we are intervening at every step to try to make that work more effectively. Dr. Brown. 
I just want to say how happy we are to welcome both of you and Dr. Simpson in their, your new roles. Thank you uh, very it seems much. as if the state of the college is very strong, right? The future is bright. And thank you for the boldness of doing such an incredible conference in person. We love it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. So I'd like to thank Dr. Turner for spending time with us uh, today. This brings about the conclusion of the uh, leadership portion of our uh, conference today. Uh, but it's not the end of the conference. As it was alluded to earlier, uh, advocacy portion starts this evening. Uh, and we'll get into that in just a minute. Uh, before we close the leadership portion, remember this is eligible for up to four hours of Category 1 CME. The paper was either in your folder or can be picked up at the registration desk outside to the left. Uh, we have recorded all of the uh, presentations that have been here today, and they'll be available for on-demand access until July 5th, 2022. The uh, other thing that I want everybody to put down uh, is that we have the dates for next year's Advocacy and Leadership Conference, uh, which is April 15th through the 18th, and you need to make note of that now so that you can get it on your calendar and be ready for uh, the second uh, year in a row back in person is our goal. Um, so let's transition just briefly to the uh, advocacy portion of the conference. Everybody that's participating in the advocacy portion of the conference should have gotten a ticket. This is for the keynote address that starts this evening at 6.30 in the room immediately next door. You'll need to present your ticket to get in and uh, that will assure your seat at the, at the table. That is a uh, lecture uh, from a, a guest and uh, dinner included. It goes from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Following that in the foyer out in front of the ballrooms here will be the PAC reception. And if you have your uh, PAC ribbon and you've contributed to the PAC, you're welcome to join us at the PAC reception uh, for the uh, remainder of the evening. That starts at uh, uh, 8 o'clock. Yes, immediately afterwards. Uh, so that concludes today. We really appreciate everybody being here. Uh, you've got a couple hours to enjoy DC before the uh, advocacy portion starts at 6.30. We look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. <laughs>